Welcome to What Living Means. I'm Vanessa Jasinski. On this episode, we're talking about the power of music. Music is a force that creates community wherever it touches. Whether it's singing in church, jamming in the garage with friends, or just drawing different crowds to a music festival, music creates a bridge that connects us as human beings. It can help us heal after a tough breakup or just get us through really bad traffic jams on the way to work in the morning. If you're a music lover, we have just the guest for you. Andy Lane is an Austin, Texas-based licensed professional counselor and songwriter. His unique approach to therapy helps people break out of creative ruts and manage difficult life changes. And please stick around after the interview because we're announcing something big for our residents. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Just tell us a little bit about your practice. What types of clients do you work with? What is it that you do? Yeah, so I can only see clients in Texas. I'm I'm a licensed professional counselor, so I can't see people like in, say, Colorado. So you can't come see me. No, I can't come see you. I see people in Texas, and right now, you know, during COVID-19, um, it's kind of all over uh, because we're doing teletherapy at this point. My practice is in South Austin, but I'm seeing clients in San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, all of that stuff. And so it's actually kind of helping me build my practice if it's just teletherapy. Mm -hmm. But those clients are predominantly, you know, you have the artists, so you'll have the musicians and the and the authors and the actors. And surprisingly, a lot of comedians, I've got a lot of comedian clients. So just a lot of kind of creative folks come to me. And a lot of people who are experiencing uh, life changes. So that's like a career change or deciding if they wanna leave their boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, you know, that kind of thing. It's It's a lot of like, seeking the journey and how do I make sense of who I am in this world of people and things, that kind of thing. How is the music part of your therapy? That's a good question. I really only use music as a tool with my teen clients. And what we'll do is, depending on if the client even wants to do this, they'll meet me at my office and they'll pull out their guitar and I'll pull out my guitar and and we'll just kind of jam together. And I found that that really helps with kids who are finding it hard to open up and trust someone. Like tell a stranger all of their deep, dark secrets. It's kind of hard to do. Go figure. But for a lot of teens, playing music opens them up. And you wouldn't guess it, but they still like Metallica. And they still <laughs> like the Toadies. And they still like all that stuff. So it's kind of fun. I'll be playing guitar with them and say, oh, yeah, I know that solo. When I was 16, I learned that solo. It's really used as a tool with teens. And with adults, it's not used really that way. It's more of a connecting point in the sense of having a song that we both know and then finding that one lyric and how it syncs up with their life and that kind of thing. The type of counseling that I do oscillates between what's called narrative therapy. And then it's also a huge Carl Jung influence. So what narrative therapy is, is that's the idea of writing your own life and finding the themes within your life that no longer serve you or are in the way of you becoming who you want to be. So in a sense, I'm kind of like the editor and my client is the author trying to take back ownership of who they are. And in that way, it's kind of tied in with music in the sense of the writing portion of it. Because whenever I started this whole journey, I was touring, I was doing all of that. 
So the two are kind of very much intertwined for me. And I found that a lot of clients who are creative and do a lot of writing, that really resonates with them. Music is such a great escape or a way for me to identify with how I'm feeling. Our company used to be down in downtown Denver. And so my commute every day was a little over an hour and 10 minutes each way. There were some mornings when I woke up and I wanted to be a little bit more Zen. And so then I had that meditation music. But the only music that really got me safely to work was jazz. Um, Thank God for Chet Baker. Yes. I love Chet. I didn't cut people off and I still got there on time and I cried and I had my coffee all before I got to work at eight. There's certain music that just exudes a certain, you know, feeling and, and attitude. So I, I love this topic and I love the fact that music can really bring people together. It has for you, it sounds like. So what do you think about you know, music and fostering a sense of community. I know you mentioned a few things. I mean, Austin is a huge music market. So how do you think it creates that sense of community? It does in a number of ways, specifically from the perspective of the artist. You can really connect with someone over a common idea and over a common difficulty that you're going through within just, hey, I think that this band would do great for this evening at this specific venue. What do you think? And then the other band goes, yeah, I think that's great. And so you hang out with that band, you create a culture, (laughs) maybe people came, maybe people didn't, and you bond with that group. And so just within kind of the backstage of a local music scene, you really have a lot of people that connect. And I've connected with people still I met when I was 16 or you know, used to play shows back then, and I'm still talking to them. It has this kind of background behind the scenes backdrop, like whenever, you know, if you ever worked at a mall, and then the mall closes, and you see everyone kind of scuttering around. uh, That's kind of like what it is with the local music scene. Yeah. As listeners, um, you know, you're telling me about Chet Baker. And I have this memory of being in New York with my friend Walker. And I'm listening to Embraceable You and we're making spaghetti. And it's the first time I went to New York by myself. And it's just such a beautiful memory. So I can now connect to you about a specific feeling that you and I both know within the audience. If you're watching a band like, I don't know, a band that just has lyrics that you shout in a mosh pit, um, the lyrics might mean one thing to me, but they mean something completely different to you. But we can meet right there in the middle and, and just shouting at the top of our lungs. And um, that connects us as a group. And it's a bridge. Within Austin, you know, we've really embraced that feeling and, and the need for that, for the culture of that. Um, one way that they've done it here is through the Health Alliance for Austin Musicians that I was part of for a long time. And that's the, if you're in the specific income bracket, they pay for a large portion, if not all of your healthcare costs, including free dental, custom earplugs, and just a bunch of awesome stuff like that. So within Austin specifically, it's been a really great awareness of that culture. And also speaking to mental health, There's the Sims Foundation in Austin in which musicians can go see a counselor uh, for like something like $10, which is, you know, remarkable. It's so cool. You've had to adapt your counseling practice and seeing patients virtually. With bars and performance spaces shut down for the time being, how do you see the music and arts community evolving into the future? Well, as far as tactics or techniques to cope, it's kind of all up in the air. I do have one hope for the community of artists in general, and that's to stop comparing one another and begin to support one another. So if I'm writing a song and I feel like it's not good enough or it's just not as good as my buddy's song or something, then I might be caught in my head and uh, I'll start spinning into anxiety and, and whatnot. And my hope is that this stillness and this break and this respite 
can be seen as exactly that, a, a respite away from the live shows and kind of more into digging into who that person is and their authenticity and what they have to offer rather than trying to compete or compare with someone else. So I'm really interested in seeing what 2021 and 2022 looks like as far as new material and new voices, just to see who decided that it was important to go inward. It was important to go to therapy. It was important to do some meditation and some just deep work and see how that connects to their overall image of what their brand is or, or what they're trying to say. As far as actually palpable techniques for what to do right now, I mean, I don't know. I'm really not sure. It's really hard for people to be creative and try and capture the ears of people. And there's Instagram Live, there's all that kind of stuff. But even having a podcast, it's like, well, I hope I can get people to listen to my podcast and not listen to their audiobook and not listen to their, you know, Embraceable You by Chet Baker. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to fight the soundscape right now. And that's kind of troubling. How does access to affordable housing actually impact an artist's ability to be creative? Allowing these musicians and these artists to have the opportunity to not be, you know, swimming to the surface the whole time and not operating out of fear of, can I pay the bills and, and, uh, all of that allows for higher level thought. Like if you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, the lowest is shelter and, and safety and, and all of that. And so being able to move along higher on that spectrum allows for people to not create art out of fear, which is really interesting. So can I ask you, so, you know, we all hear about writer's block. I mean, I don't know because I'm not, I'm not a writer. So how do people overcome things like writer's block or, you know, for me, it's not writer's block. It's um, exercise block. I have a bike that sits right next to my bed and I can't even get on it. I think it's blocked. <laughs> like I'm blocked from exercise. <laughs> so any sort of blockage, how do you overcome that? When you think about writer's block, think about it in terms of, a filter. So there's a filter that's a specter that's kind of above you. And it's a part of yourself that says you're not good enough. And it's a part of yourself that says, this is not worth showing the world. And so when we get into writer's block, we are in the mode of, I need to do things to become a better person. I need to do things to be more prolific in my art and whatnot. Instead of being a human being, <laughs> we become human doings. And so writer's block is all about fighting that filter. And that filter, I think, comes from burnout. Burnout of doing the same thing routinely and getting tired of that. And so if we think about the idea or the metaphor of burning out, you think about a fireplace and there's a fire like you're burning. And so whenever the flame is lit, then you're thriving in your work, you're thriving in your practice and you have logs on the fire. So I think about it in terms of, well, where'd you get the logs? You have to chop wood. So in order to chop wood, in this metaphor, I think that that's play. Um, we need to learn how to play again because we get caught up in just the mundane nature of life. And so whenever I've had writer's block, a way that I've introduced play to kill off that filter that I was talking about before is to change the medium of what I'm doing. So uh, the biggest writer's block I ever had was when I was 26, I think. And I just could not write a song. I did not believe in myself. I just couldn't do it. And so I went to HEB, which is what we have here in Texas. I went to my first HEB the other day and I was like, what is this place? This is amazing. Sorry. <laughs> Everything's bigger in Texas, even grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And so I got this bag of frozen vegetables and I was like, I'm going to cook. <laughs> and so I went home 
and I got on, I, I pulled out my wok that I never used because I never cooked and I threw the frozen vegetables on the wok and then I added way too many spices and and I just started finding this flow and I discovered that I was playing again and um whenever I finished the dish I was like man I I feel so much better and then I picked up my guitar and I wrote another song introducing play is was what it's all about whenever you're trying to combat writer's block. And it sounds like you, it's almost going back to just simplicity, you know, like the, the thing that you would do on a daily basis, how do you do it in a way that just makes you feel like you've, you've done something different. You've accomplished something. I mean, just you making a simple dinner at night helped you change that writer's block because you were trying something new. We have so many things and thoughts and technology and our phones and we have to check this and that. It's, you know, maybe the, the simplest thing is what I'm hearing is just stripping that away and, and focusing on something like a daily task that could be that igniter, I guess. Oh, yeah. Igniter is a good word for it, especially during right now, like during this time, we're going to be caught up in our heads so much of thinking what other people are thinking of us and of what we're saying and is is something that i said good enough is it cool enough am i funny am i annoying what's going on with me so it's so important to catch ourselves and to say no you're not unique you're not special in that fact everyone's thinking that walk away from this and go do something that grounds you that's not out of fear Andy, thank you so much for joining us would you mind closing the show with a song our listeners would love it. <laughs> I left all my father's dreams behind about them since I called you last night say it out loud I was once a grandchild oh mountain moon I can't face you so I've shut the bonds and I've locked you outside
<laughs> if you're a Yes resident and sing or play a musical instrument, we want to hear from you. Send us your best track and enter for a chance to win $2,500 in new gear. Check the link in the show notes for details. Thank you for listening to What Living Means. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We'd really appreciate it. I'm Vanessa Jasinski, and we'll see you next time.